All right, this is an iPad 4 with uh, no charge. So um, the common things have already been tried to put the board into a known good housing with a known good battery and it will boot up, but it won't charge. And the charging port has been changed. And when you've changed the charging port, changed, you know, try, the battery doesn't really fail um, very commonly, but if you've put the board into another housing and it still doesn't charge, then that points to a failure of the charging IC chip U2, which is a really common failure in any device that has a lightning port like the iPad 4. So we're going to try and uh, see if changing that U2 chip will restore the charging function of this iPad. Damage to the U2 IC chip happens from uh, use of non-Apple chargers. The deal is that uh, in all the designs of these mobile devices, that use the lightning port, the, the um, voltage protection is not on the device side, it's on the charger side. So if you use a Apple charger, then you have voltage protection built into your charger. But if you use a non-Apple charger, like a 7-Eleven charger, then that assumes that the voltage protection is in the device, which it's not. So those things, they tend to be, you know, pretty dangerous and kind of low rent in general. Let's see if we can get a look at this area or not. And especially car chargers um, will, when you start a car and you're switching over from the battery to the alternator, then that can uh, create some voltage fluctuations that can pass through your charger and damage your U2 IC chip. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to get a, um, a view of this area. I'll, we'll find the U2 charging IC chip, which lives over here under this shield. There it is. Okay, so the black stuff, that is our enemy, and that stuff is called underfill, and it is squirted on at the factory during production with um, uh, you know a, some sort of a, a liquid you know syringe type system and then it's cured to be a really tough hard um, material and the purpose of it is to um, protect the tiny chip uh, sitting on its array of 36 balls from um, drop damage. When you drop your iPad, throw it on the bed. You don't want to get a separation or a cold, a cold solder joint. So I'm putting just a little bit of general heat on here just to kind of heat that up a little bit. And then I need to be able to kind of uh, at least cut the edges of this hard cured adhesive in order to be able to hope to get the chip off. Otherwise, it will take more heat than is, is uh, desired to, to get this off. I think I'm going to cut my bracket so that I can have a little bit more space. Yeah? Huh? No, I'm not going to do that. All right. So that gives us a little bit more.
it's, this is a good chip to start on to, to sort of learn how to work with this underfill stuff. It's not a grotesque amount of underfill like on the iPhone 5U2 IC chip. And that repair is really difficult. Because the U2 shares a border with the actual CPU in the iPhone 5. That's a challenge because if you use too much heat on this, you know, that kind of spreads over to the CPU through the board, which it's gonna do, you, if you get it too hot, then the little solder balls that are trapped in the underfill under the CPU chip will um, kind of swell and not have any place to go. And that, that's a, not a good situation. So it's really easy to just totally fry up the board completely. And that's not cool because, you know, these phones that can't charge are, you know, quasi workable. If you, if you carried around a couple extra batteries, you could switch them out. iPad, not so much, but phone, you know, you could, you could kind of live with a U2 failure to phone. This is where it's the, the heaviest. I'm going to put a little bit more heat. Just to kind of warm it up a little bit. And that softens it, you know, just a little bit. So the risk here is actually scratching, you know, I'm, you can see that I'm scratching down to the copper and exposing the copper. Um, you know, and that's okay because it at least sort of makes a bit of a guideline for placing the new chip. I'm going to put some flux on here, and then I'm going to try to get this off. So you're, you, you know, the actual, you know, everyone's question is, what temperature are you going to use and what airflow? And, and the answer is, um, you have to figure out for yourself what airflow and what temperature is going to create the effect and what nozzle. I'm using a, a I think this is the, I don't know, like the four millimeter nozzle. This is a Hako uh, FR801 hot air station. I used to use the digital one, but then I like this one better because you can kind of control it on the fly. And you just have to sort of work with it to figure out how do you get the blast of relatively intense heat that's going to pretty quickly lift this chip off the board without you know spreading all over the board and and damaging a bunch of other stuff um, so you have to kind of figure that out experimentally what your goal is to really watch the other components that are surrounding the the chip that you're trying to lift off So I'm about ready to do that. I'm going to put on a shield. So what I'm doing here is um, using a using a regular old EMI shield, I'm just sort of moving it to the right position to cover most of the board, and then I'm putting holding that in place with cap to tape. Let it heat up a little bit. It was off. We're going to watch the adjacent components to see when they all turn shiny 
then that tells us that the balls underneath the chip are liquid enough to let us remove the chip because our, our main goal is to not tear a pad. Pads get torn when you try to get it off without using enough heat and that's mostly going to be because your, your station is set to be too cool where you feel like oh this is taking forever I'm heating and heating and heating I'm roasting this board this is horrible and it's not coming off so then you're inclined to to rip it off too early and what you should do instead is adjust figure out you know how to adjust your your hot air change your airflow change your temperature change your nozzle until you can get it to come off with a relatively short blast of heat all right so now I'm coming in here with my with my uh, heat source and I am at a bit of an angle so that I can use my microscope and that's okay look at these these are not shiny silver and it's a little bit hard to tell on this microscope It looks like it should be ready to come off. All right, so we got it off. There, all the way up. And that's about how long that should take. All right, next step is cleanup. So we can see how all of these uh, original solder balls are trapped in this underfill. So we can kind of just power through that and clean that off with a uh, relatively standard, you know, soldering iron tip. So I'm going to, and here's the old chip. Alright, so there's some flex on there. We can get this pretty close. All right, it's heating up. All right, here we go. So I'm, I'm just sort of scrubbing off the black underfill. This is the same basic idea of, you know, kind of scrubbing off the top layer of a board when you're doing a blue screen repair. Stuff just doesn't like heat. Now you gotta, this is where you have to be really careful. You, you really don't want to tear your pads. Tearing pads is a giant pain. If you tear a pad, you know, it's going to require you to do some kind of a micro jumper to, to serve the pad under your chip. That's a real big pain. You want to avoid that if you can.
let's clean that and see uh, see how many more times we need to, to do this. So this is just alcohol to kind of clean off that area and see what it looks like. So you get the idea that we have still, you know, quite a bit of work to do. You know, we can try to use a tool to kind of get at that underfill. But what I'm going to do, and you, you can see like right here, there's like a ridge right there. So that's still, that still has some material that needs to be removed. All right, so the uh, we lost the video for a, for a bit there, and in the meantime, I've been uh, cleaning off black underfill. So I've been um, using some, you know, the large iron, and then I switched to the smaller uh, mini hot tweezers that I like to use, and just sort of heated and scrubbed and cleaned with alcohol, and um, and and I think this looks pretty good. I've got all my pads intact. And I can still kind of use this tool. This is a this is a new tool I got. It's a it's a the pro quality dental pick from my Fix It tools, which is a really really useful tool. I really like it. I just got that this week. And you can kind of scratch scratch off any sort of remaining um, bits of underfill or some of the dried flux residue that's on there. But right now I'm happy with that. I think that this that this is a pretty good uh, finish for cleaning step. Now the pads have the lead-free solder from the factory, and we're going to be using a chip. Most of the time, when you order the U2 chip, it will already have um, it will already have pre it'll come pre-balled with the same lead-free um, solder balls. So. This time, we're not going to try to change that um, solder from lead-free to leaded in order to make it easy on us to place a new chip. If we were trying to reball an old chip, then we would, since we would reball it using a leaded solder paste. All right. Okay, time for the new chip. So I'm going to add some uh, some flux. Now this is something that I that I um, used to not offer as a service, but so far I've had a 100% success rate for uh, for a, a little bit of time now, and so I have started offering it. This one is actually sent in for this repair. So if you want to just get your iPad for U2 uh, IC chip changed as a mail-in repair then you can then you can do that so you have to pay attention to where was the dot the orientation on your chip when you took it off and on on this one it's right there which is the bottom corner in this orientation all right let's kind of zoom out a little bit so we can see a larger view of the chip all right, so our plan now is to kind of do the reverse from when we took the chip off. Um, we've still got our shield for protection on here. And what I really want to do is let the chip kind of seat itself. So the, the uh, solder balls underneath will melt. 
and then surface tension combined with the flux will uh, lead them to sort of line up themselves. So my goal right now is to just kind of get this in a reasonably close alignment and then to use a low enough airflow that I don't blow it off of that alignment. So right now to me that looks good. So I will fire up my hot air. Now if this were leaded solder I would be dropping my temperature down and it would uh, it would it require a lot less heat, but since this is still the lead-free, then you know the the lead-free solder itself is going to melt at about 260C, and we want to give it a chance to do that. So we're going to watch to see um, the adjacent components turn turn shiny, and then we'll give it another few seconds after that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead in. Oh, that's way too much flow. I'm going to pull my dial back, my flow, because I really, I really shouldn't have to hold the chip on there that much, maybe a little bit, but not like that. And that's maybe too much, too much flux, but... Everything's hot. I can see that top component melting. Alright, let's give that a try. So I hope you guys notice that. That you could see this, uh, this capacitor here um, start to float a little bit. So I gave it a couple of seconds past that. And now we'll let it cool down on its own. Not sure that this this microscope will let us easily see this edge tonight. There we go. I think that looks okay. It's hard to see with the glare. So let's try to take off the flux that's around this chip. I'm touching with my hand now to make sure it's, you know, come down to a reasonable temperature, which it has. And the chip is not flipping off or floating away, so that's good. And even if this, and even if this chip, you know, doesn't work out, I can, uh, now that the underfill is gone, it will be a lot easier to, you know, take it off and try another chip. Alright, let's pull it up. Alright, that's good enough for us to give this a try. So we can kind of put you down here. We'll leave that open for a second, charge port back on. 
grab a screw for the battery. And I got a question about, you know, is it why are you connecting the battery first? Shouldn't you be connecting the LCD first? Which you can do. Um, but since I know that this, well, I know it's got a stone dead battery, but I know also that this iPad is uh, off. It's been disconnected from the battery. So I know that it's okay in the iPad 4 to connect my test LCD. So this, now we're going to plug in and see, it might take a while, but we'll see if it responds at all to a charge. Okay, so now we're going to take it over to uh, an iPad charger. And remember that before the... Um, this iPad was completely um, completely unresponsive. Now we'll hopefully cross our fingers, plug it into the lightning charger. And it's showing us the low battery icon. Um, let's see, if we disconnect, it's showing us that it does not detect the charger and then plugging in the charger. Oops. It shows us the low battery icon and that the charger is connected. All right, so we're going to let this charge up. And you know, this flashing is pretty typical of when the battery is super drained like that. And you change the U2 chip and it will. Um, it will flash like that. I've noticed that in the other repairs as well. Um, and it, it may be that the chip that is available is a, a slight mismatch or that the, um, the battery is, is extremely drained um, when, the, um, when it's kind of been sitting in a housing with a defective U2 chip. Um, but eventually in my experience, it will charge, and then it doesn't behave like that after it charges up for a bit. But that flashing is typical. All right, we're gonna let this go for, you know, for some time and check back on it in a little bit. Okay, it's been a while, <clears throat> and this has just been sitting on the charger and it has started up. It's detected the charger and charged all the way up to 46% charge. So this is a, is a success and iPad 4 no charging because of U2 um, charging logic IC damage is solved by just changing that chip.